Avast ye lubbers, else you'll get a keel haulin'. Said to be used by pirates and the navy right up until the 19th century, this form of torture was not intended as a type of execution, but more often than not, it was lethal and few lived through it. The sentence meant that the man punished was tied at the feet, dragged under the boat along the keel, and then back up the other side. A correspondent for the London Morning Advertiser who witnessed the punishment said, quote, Yesterday I tried to write a description of a most horrible sight. It was so revoltingly cruel, so barbarous, so infamously brutal, that I gave it up. Ancient Sea Laws Although keel hauling was occasionally used by pirates, it was actually a more common practice on ships owned by the French, Dutch, and British Navy. Its origins appear to go back centuries, and depictions of the torture method are mentioned in the Lex Rhodia, a body of regulations that laid out practices at sea in the 7th century. The rules have their roots in Rhodian sea law, going back to the ancient Greeks. In his book Voyages to the East Indies by Christoph Frick, who worked as a surgeon for the Dutch East India Company, Frick describes the use of keel hauling on board ship. Quote, he that strikes an officer or master of the ship is without hopes of pardon to be thrown into the sea, fastened by a rope with which he is thrown in on one side of the ship and drawn up again on the other. And so three times together he is drawn round the keel of the ship, in the doing of which, if they should chance not to allow rope enough to let him sink below the keel, the malefactor might have his brains knocked out. This punishment is called keel balin, which may be called an English keel drawing. A pitiless process. There were all sorts of offences that could land a person in trouble on board ship, anything from stealing to stowing away and from murder to mutiny. It was ultimately up to the captain who got punished and how, and it didn't matter whether he was pirate or naval, the result was usually the same. A swift and brutal punishment as standards had to be maintained. The usual process of keel hauling meant that the prisoner, whether that was a pirate or a sailor, would have their hands and feet tied up. Then they would be hanged by either their hands or sometimes upside down by their feet from the yardum, the part of the wooden mast that supports the sail. More rope would be tied to the prisoner and fed for a pulley on one side of the ship. The rope was then threaded underneath the vessel and back up around the other side. Often there were two pulleys, one on either side of the ship, to make things easier. Then, with either a gun or even a cannon being fired, or with just a shout from the captain, the torture would begin and the prisoner would be dropped over the side of the ship. Depending on the size of the vessel, this drop into the water could be like a body hitting a brick wall. Falling into the water from a height of 80 to 160 feet exerts a tremendous amount of force on the body, which can cause trauma to the shoulders, neck, and back, concussion, and internal bleeding from ruptured organs and where the ship was in the world would determine the temperature of the water that the criminal was being thrown into. If it was in the north, being dropped into cold liquid can also cause a person to go into cold water shock and either die from cardiac arrest or drowning from involuntarily inhaling water. The older a ship was, then the more barnacles would have attached themselves to the external surface of the keel. The shells of these marine crustaceans are razor sharp. The deckhands on the ship's opposite side would take up the rope and begin pulling the prisoner underneath the keel to the other side. If they pulled the rope quickly, the poor sailor would not only scrape against the keel, he would also scrape against all of the barnacles on his journey round, which would rip the flesh from his body. Some men were so badly injured by the process that they would be pulled out of the water with missing limbs or even suffer from decapitation. After being dragged back up to the ship's deck, the prisoner would be left to hang there, suspended from the yardum again, gasping for breath, a bloody mess with their skin shredded and the salt water seeping into their wounds. There they would hang for as long as the captain saw fit, until with a loud shout of, AGAIN, the wretch would be dropped back into the sea and dragged back across the keel in the opposite direction. It was usual to be pulled around about three times before the captain declared that was enough. Depending on the number of barnacles stuck to the keel, by the third time of dunking, there might actually not be that much left of the prisoner, perhaps just an arm or a leg. Most people died during the process, but if still alive, whatever shape of the body remaining would be left to hang there for a while on the deck as a warning to the other pirates, sailors, or passengers not to step out of line. For those that were still alive at this point, the chances of surviving the infections contracted from their open wounds was pretty low. 
And although you weren't supposed to die and the idea of kill hauling was as a brutal punishment rather than a death sentence, after several dunkings hanging from the yardum, half dead with a multitude of open sores, and having the salty sea air blowing into the wounds, death would have probably seemed like a much nicer alternative. Slow but sure. What if the deckhands pulled the prisoner around slowly rather than ripping his body against the keel at high speed? Well, tying weights to the body would make it sink more and rather than scraping across the ship, the sailor would experience the sensation of drowning. The Dutch were known for shoving an oil-soaked sponge or rag into the prisoner's mouth before dropping them over the side to prolong the suffering. They believed using the rag meant that you could suck in air and take another breath underwater before dying. And what if the ship was only small and narrow or quite new in the water with not many barnacles attached? Well, there was a way around that problem too. How about dragging the men under the boat lengthways from bow to stern rather than widthways? Some vessels could be anywhere up to and over 200 feet long, which would mean spending up to four times longer underwater than if they were keelhauled widthways. Comfortably numb. One of the best descriptions of a weighted keel hauling comes from the book written by the sea poet William Faulkner in 1769. In a Universal Dictionary of the Marine, Faulkner describes keel hauling as, quote, a punishment inflicted for various offenses in the Dutch Navy. It is performed by plunging the delinquent repeatedly under the ship's bottom on one side and hoisting him up on the other after having passed under the keel. The blocks or pulleys by which he is suspended are fastened to the opposite extremities of the main yard and a weight or lead or iron is hung upon his legs to sink him to a competent depth. By this apparatus, he is drawn close up to the yard arm and thence let fall suddenly into the sea, where passing under the ship's bottom, he is hoisted up on the opposite side of the vessel. As this extraordinary sentence is executed with a serenity of temper peculiar to the Dutch, the culprit is allowed sufficient intervals to recover the sense of pain, of which indeed he is frequently deprived during the operation. In truth, a temporary insensibility to his sufferings ought by no means to be construed into a disrespect of his judges when we consider that this punishment is supposed to have peculiar propriety in the depth of winter, whilst the flakes of ice are floating on the stream, and that it is continued till the culprit is almost suffocated for want of air, benumbed with the cold of water, or stunned with the blows his head received by striking the ship's bottom. It's possible that the idea for this punishment originated from the Middle Ages, when ducking stools were a thing and being plunged into water as a public penance and humiliation was popular. Falconer goes on to describe another marine punishment, this time used by the French, who quote, On those who have been convicted of desertion, blasphemy, or exciting sedition, it is performed as follows. The criminal is placed astride of a short, thick baton, fastened to the end of a rope, which passes through a block hanging at one of the yard arms. Thus fixed, it is hoisted suddenly up to the yard, and the rope being slackened at once, he is plunged into the sea. The chattismant is repeated several times comfortable to the purport of the sentence pronounced against the culprit, who has at that time several cannon shots fastened to his feet during the punishment, which is rendered public by the firing of a gun, to advertise to other ships of the fleet there of that their crews may become spectators. This seems very similar to medieval ducking, just on a bigger stage. Naval punishment being used as a spectator sport is also shown in the painting The Keel Hauling of the Ship's Surgeon of Admiral Jan van Ness. Painted in 1660 by the Dutch Golden Age artist, Liv Pieters Vechouet, it shows a large crowd of hundreds of men gathering around the ship to watch the keel hauling show. Any form of capital punishment at sea was done in public to deter any other potential offenders. A fate worse than death. Keelhauling was a brutal and bloody punishment, and as a deterrent, just using their own ship, some rope, and some pretty grim sea creatures, a captain was able to scare the pants off their passengers and crew. The Royal Navy stopped keelhauling by the 1700s, and by the 1750s so had the Dutch, although the French continued with it until the mid-19th century. Perhaps we should finish with the correspondent for the London Morning Advertiser, who finally found a way to describe the court-martial of two Egyptian men for attempted murder outside Alexandria that he witnessed in 1882. Quote, The one upon the strain of the rope had fallen was apparently lifeless. His face was turned towards us. He was bleeding and torn. 
His clothes were hanging in shreds and his hands were dripping with blood. His eyes were open, but they seemed to be filled with blood. The ship's bottom covered with barnacles rasped upon the poor devil like nails. The nose of one wretch was almost torn away. One ear was gone. He was bloody literally from head to foot. After another round of keel hauling for 21 seconds, the men were unconscious and, quote, probably dead. The correspondent stated that, quote, death would have been a better fate than what they had undergone. Thank you for watching this episode of Walk the Plank. Please subscribe if you enjoy these videos, and I'll see you next week for another one. Cheers.